Am I right or am I right? <laughs> what does it say? A person who cultivates an area of interest such as the arts without real commitment. <laughs> oh my god, no! It's a, the opposite of a goddess. Jesus. <laughs> Is it filming? <laughs> yeah. He called me a dilettante. No. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. 
respond to that, and I think with the rest of this, the series, I wanted to respond to those things as plainly as I could. Yeah. So I, I never wanted to say anything dramatic. I never, I never want to make like some crazy statement. I want to um, hide some of the references, hide a lot of meaning. And I think I do, I do that sometimes. Um, but but you know, the flash is pointing at it at the thing I want you to notice first. Mm -hmm. But I think what's more important in images is, is the stuff that you can't see, the stuff that uh, isn't in the picture frame. Or you know that, that's in the shadows. Dog sort of reminds me very much of like Stand by Me. Like you want to go see a dead body, but you come, <laughs> no, no. but you you become that that child who's either leading or being led. I mean, I guess you're leading the viewers to that mm -hmm. dead body, to that point of moment that you're trying to show them. You know, you're offering it up. Um, my follow up question had to do with you know at a certain point in the series. Instead of showing something other, something that you found, mm -hmm. it becomes the, the focus shifts and it becomes showing an element of yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. And crotch is sort of like standing mm -hmm. with the, the camera and it's like, mm -hmm. you know, directly showing you. And then even more removed is um, you know, a dream where you're actually just fully within the, uh, the camera shot. Yeah, I think what happens is, well, there's like limits to what a camera can do depending on what. The, what device you're working with. Mm -hmm. So uh, a wider angle lens is going to produce an image that I guess it speaks more to the environment that you're inhabiting. But when you think about how close you can get to things practically with the camera, um, you, you're very limited uh, unless you go into a laboratory and you use like a microscopic camera or, some, or something that, that is involved with micro uh, microscopes or microscopic technology, um, but the the idea is with those images where the camera is really close to my body, um, is yeah, it's a, it's about mimicking and imitating how I'm observing myself, how I'm observing my body, um, how it might feel to look from where I'm looking at myself, where you, and um, I I think sometimes. It's, it's, it's important to think of what could exist in an outsider's perspective, right? In these really private moments. Um, what could those things be if they were shared experiences? Like masturbation, which is something that it, um, I mean, maybe it's not it's so relevant anymore, you know, that that was a private activity, because I think more and more there are technologies that are making it more accessible for people to share things like that, more personal aspects of their lives. Um, but I think it was important for me to, yeah, to use the camera as this tool that is, is lurking in the shadows, is, uh, I guess it would be like a self orgasm right? For example, we've used to talk about this series has been empathetic orgasm, which is what you, you were doing in order to engage with my imagery. Um, but I, I'm really interested in like, pushing what the camera can do. I'm interested in uh, distorting, distorting what I guess would be classical tropes in photography, so like the self-portrait or like the like the tableau, you know, the, just I mean, I guess the most immediate examples. Um, hmm. This might be, yeah, a separate sort of departure from that. Mm -hmm. But that's um, okay. Yeah, it, it's good for us to just keep funding from idea to idea. Yeah. Um, one thing that I noticed throughout your series, mm -hmm. um, well, I guess I'll start with this. One thing that attracted me to the series was the were these moments where um, you know it has these ebbs and flows, right? It has these, these quiet, more intimate moments, mm -hmm. or not not necessarily more intimate, but it has these quiet moments, and then it has these little bursts, mm -hmm. bursts and pops. And there's different levels of intimacy with each one, where you're either um, confronted with this charge imagery. In a very intimate way, or you're observing something, and sometimes like that comes mm -hmm. intimate. Anyway. Um, did you have thoughts about rhythm? And you know, I know that you conceptualize the series as being one continuous night that you're sort of following. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what was the thought process going into that? So I think so. And I think this this is a good question because it, you you want to believe. I think this is a good question because you want to believe that um, the, art, the artistic processes 
you know, here's step one, and then here's step two, here's step three, and then here's step four, the, the natural conclusion. Yeah. Um, but there's so much that you don't see, right? Um, I think this project specifically was um, maybe hovering around 3,000 images or 2,000 images, something, something like that, right? I can't remember the number. Um, but you, from there, you know, then I made, then I made an edit about um, what I was responding to, what stuck out for me. I think there were a lot of images from that um, that night that could have made it into the series that also could have made sense. Um, but I, I guess it's about like that punto, right? The studio. There's like a, there's a photographer, Tom uh, Todd Heidel, who says, you know, all killer, no filler. And I think that was the goal was to include images that were the visual were visually the strongest. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I was editing, you know, there was like a process where where I am compromising the poetics and the poetic interests, right? So I think photographs that I that are personally more appealing to me are things that just like completely understated. Yeah. Um, and most of the time they're empty spaces and things that are left alone and you, they're just absorbed in, in their loneliness. And I think with this series, I was trying to push forward a voice that was more attention seeking, a character that was more attention seeking. Um, and yeah, I think I think the edit speaks to violence in a way. I think it speaks to um, to fear. I think it speaks to to you know pleasure. I think that was a word that I may have thought about. But, but yeah, but all along the way, I'm not I'm not like metering a rhythm. Mm -hmm. I'm metering for uh, observations to say, not like thinking you know like what's the outcome. I'm, I'm just like making, mm -hmm. and then I think that's really with this project specifically. But and just in general, uh, I try to just scout for things out in the world and then whatever comes, whatever piques my interest in, I'm like, okay, like, that's the that's subject right now. But um, I guess I wish I had a more regular practice, but it's like bad. I think I have bad practice. <laughs> well, I think maybe maybe this is a part of you going out searching for these you know, moments within the world and sort of like collecting in that way. But um, another thing that I was drawn to was your use of almost things that are nearly like kitschy in a way too, mm -hmm. um, especially in your re-photographs, you have the prints and the you know sighting, which is the owl poster. You have prints which like has this subtle nod to, in my mind, like these Richard Prince re-photographs, you mm -hmm. know? And then, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. but then even, even yeah. in the in tree where there's um, you know, the Salvador Dali painting in the back, there are these like little nods to these other artists that are also little nods to these kitschy little pieces of culture. Mm -hmm. Were those just found also through searching for components? Mm -hmm. or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, they were, I think a lot of this, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give too much credit to how, I don't want to overemphasize like how important those moments are, or like how magical they are. I think they're, I think they, they are coincidences, and I, I mean, there's no, uh, there's no secret that we're like, any artist is sitting down and looking at images or looking at work and then is thinking about what associations they're making. But um, I was not, I was not like sitting down thinking about Salvador Dali when I, when I took that image. I took that image and drinking a little bit. And, uh, like in the process, I like had the camera with me and, I, and it, it just accompanied me. Um, but after the fact, when I, when I was making the edit, I was thinking, you know, like, um, Dali has entered kitsch. Dali and I think surrealists and uh, symbolists have entered uh, the lexicon of kitsch. I think they belong to it now. Um, and the reason why I'm interested in that is because we project our desires through kitsch. Um, and I think the reason why this has become locked in at some point, right? And they belong to subcultures like, um, well, I guess I don't even have to name them, but, but, but you know, like subcultures and countercultures, is because they're tasteless. They, they're they not supposed to be refined. They're meant to hold cheap and fast meanings. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that there's a way through photography to elevate that. I think that there's a way that the image is becoming even more sacred now because of the way that we use it in our everyday lives. Because of the way that um, you, I mean, you ask anybody on the street, you know, to show them some, to show you something from their phones, and you'll see kitschy things that they value a lot. I think that they attach a lot of sentimental meaning to that. So um, I'm interested in how that does happen for some people. And I'm interested in how that happens for me. So, you know, it comes forward in this project where Prince is, in, is a personal is a personal link to a path to my past, and I think he's migrating for me into the language of Kish. I mean, I mean, I think his whole experience uh, or his whole his representation when he was alive in in life was um, was one that was about the counter. It was one that was about drag, it was one about uh, mixing elements that are normally counter to each other. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, that's something that I want to carry through the work, too. Yeah, even thinking about how some elements of, I don't know if formal is the right word, but some more formal um, elements of photography have even started to like venture into like your use of them like you know for instance just the use of the new right something that's used over and over, and over. Mm -hmm. but even adding something as small as the twist of having you know a direct piece within the new you know mm -hmm. um i feel like it takes it one step mm -hmm. you know to where you're utilizing i don't even know if that's kitsch but mm -hmm. you know pornography is kitschy right yeah. and then you know you have a piece of happiness you yeah. know which is then used in Man Ray. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about, so you were obviously willing to go forward with the creation of these, uh, this series like in tandem, you know, your series having been completed, but more just an editing down process and then conceptualizing the installation, but uh, how do you feel also about the works that have arisen you know, from my end? Mm -hmm. Like, are there any pieces that stand out to you and, you know, feel as, you know, which ones feel like the best fit for you? Mm -hmm. I think, um, and points, and points in the series, when we were talking about it, mm -hmm. you know, like we had conversations about it, um, I think the, I mean, I can't remember the name of it, but the one where there's a, there's a dog, and how, right. how, so I think, I think in how, um, you are suggesting something is happening, mm -hmm. right? You're, but, and then, and then that, that, that's another thing, right? Where your like, references are hidden. Like, there's a very direct reference to, what was the movie? The Shining. The Shining, right? So there's a reference to The Shining, um, which is something that's like, it's grotesque, it's like fearful. So, so the same, similar things to the stuff that I'm interested in, right? Mm -hmm. But in a different language, in a different medium. Um, but I think that one fits the most because. Uh, it's about a fantasy. It's about something that isn't supposed to be seen. It's about something that's private. It's about something that's uh, that's taboo, and it's funny. <laughs> I think I think uh, so. Maybe the, the point that might be lost on the audience sometimes, or on other people, is that the the work isn't trying to take itself too seriously, yeah. right? Um, and I think that's I think that your work offers up that that voice or that perspective. Mm -hmm. It's like saying like, hey. This is uh, this is this is savvier than you think it is. This isn't like, and I, and I think that's that's what's going on, right? I call it the body of work sad party, mm -hmm. and I think Pal is really emblematic emblematic of what you titled your response, right? Which is after party, and uh, I, 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 there's no implication that like um, there's a reason to be sad during an after party, right? The after party is just like the party that continues going on, the party that happens after the initial <laughs> party. So, and I think, I think how, as that spirit, I think it, uh, it wants to invite something out of you to play. Um, and I think that's happening in some of the other images, you know, um, like Closet. I think Closet was really important for me because it was tapping into something nascent, no, not nascent, latent in me, which is the spirit of the dark. Um, and I think many people 
are, are they're afraid of the dark. And, and this reminds me of an image by um, Jeff Wall, and uh, there's a photograph where there's a figure who turns around like in, in the dark, and he notices another figure who could be following him. So the I think the thing Jeff Wall, and I mean there's other references in there, right? Like there's a shadow that looks like a penis in the in that image specifically that I'm talking about. Um, but it's something that's really universal, which is something that I think I get, that I get excited about. Um, these, uh, these moments where you're alone and you don't feel alone. It's, just something, it's like this very primal fear. Mm-hmm. And then I think your, your work is like making a joke of sometimes. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, no. And I think those moments, too, where maybe my work is using humor, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to, cope, to, cope, to cope with some really intense, you know, to cope, but, but yeah. also not taking things too seriously. But um, I think that also sort of skirts that line that that was that conversation that we wanted to have, mm-hmm. you know, too about mm-hmm. empathetic voyeurism and what it means to look in on mm-hmm. someone else's um, experience and create a response to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was wondering just. Obviously, this is a series that you had created mm-hmm. two years ago or something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, like a year and a half. How how has had the process of mm-hmm. having me look in on your work and create response pieces? Mm-hmm. How did just the creation of those pieces affect your view on your work? I mean, it made me want to make more. Uh, and you, I mean, you're using Blender, which is a a tool that I've wanted to. But the, that type of tool, I wanted to investigate that. I'm mm-hmm. really interested in um, in not using a camera to make an image, and not using uh, a tangible surface to make an image. Um, because I think that's that's like sort of the magic of photography is that you're painting with light. That's the thing that people say. Um, and I don't I don't like to be too romantic about it, but I think um, a computer the computer's perspective, which is this thing that's entering the the dialogue or the di- the dialogue that's happening in the, in the art world, I think it is teaching us something. I think it wants us wants us to learn something mm-hmm. about human consciousness, right? Um, and I just I just think it's so fascinating that things that we think are difficult to manifest through our imagination, a computer is already capable of manufacturing those things. Um, and, you know, we don't have a crop tool in our brains, we don't have an, an array, a stamp tool, we don't have an erase tool, and I think that means something. I think that there's something uh, happening where we're creating tools in order to manipulate things, right? And I think that Blender is also offering up this new, um, Blender and technology is like it, they're offering up a new language to see things, a new vocabulary to see things. Um, which changes the way that we think about it in, in its entirety. So, and I think for me, what it, what it really meant was that my well, I think one of the things that I was thinking was, you know, I can make a video game of my my story, you know, this narrative, and then I it sort of had me thinking, you know, like about this idea, right, uh, from poetry or about um, the simulacrum, uh, which proposes that because we live in an image world. Um, we no longer exist in the, in the here and now, right? We exist in a, a world that is made up of projections and um, of our imagination. So, you know, I, I think that that's just something that we can now explore because we have these tools. That now that we have the, things like Blender um, and everything that's like Blender, I can't remember, I can't like list technology, like other programs like Blender. Right, or like, or 3D printing, um, which, uh, you know, there, there could be a world that exists, like, very soon, where everything that we use is 3D printed, everything that we use is designed on, strictly speaking, on a computer, only made by computers, um, and there might be a point in time where art is only made by computers or with computers, um, which, yeah, that, I think that's something that we might be able to speak about because we'll be in opposition towards that by using traditional media. And um, as 
the environment becomes a greater concern to the country and to the world, the the economic or not the economic um, the production the production that artists um, the space that artists take mm -hmm. and the carbon footprint and the environmental footprint and the impact that the artist makes comes into question mm -hmm. as those things become more and more politicized. So you know, is there like virtue that exists in computers? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know yet. Do I want to know? Yes. I do. Or should we be afraid? Like you know, like we are afraid of the natural world. I think the conversation that usually is brought up is you know that as artists use computers more and more to create work. Mm -hmm. The, there's less of a connection between the artist and the, the physical medium and the physical object that it produces. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as primarily painting is my, probably my go to medium mm -hmm. in terms of making work and, you know, my mode of expression, right? Mm -hmm. um, after, you know, this is my first series working with Blender, and mm -hmm. I totally undervalue the physicality of it, mm -hmm. you know? the actual, like, grueling nature of learning a new medium, mm -hmm. even, if, even though it was just clicking buttons at the end of the day, you know, mm -hmm. but the mental gymnastics mm -hmm. and the amount of actual repetitive mm -hmm. functions that I had to keep doing mm -hmm. to produce something that I actually wanted. It was, you know, for me, I was trying to replicate what John Wall or, um, Gregory Crudson would do to create his composition, right? When you have control of every aspect. But with technology, when you have more and more and more control of everything, you know, not only can you introduce a light into a space, but you can control every aspect of that light. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. With infinite power mm -hmm. comes infinite responsibilities, you know? <laughs> and infinite confusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like learning to draw for the first time. I think we were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the most important image for you in this series of show? Because I, I, I'm asking, I'm like looking at the, the another the question where I'm asking about um, different types of media, but you're, excuse me, used to making paintings, right? right. And it's, I think it's okay for me to assume because from what I've seen and observed on the outside, is that you've exclusively worked with painting excuse me, for the past few years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but these are not paintings. Uh, and I don't even think that there's any... I, I wouldn't even say that there were similarities between this process and painting. Uh, I think it could maybe be a little bit of a reach to say that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in, in my goal, what do you think is the most important industry in this series? Well, so I think to briefly touch on that, like the painting and the digital works that end up coming out of it. The similarity that I saw between the two mediums was um, coming from the background of collage mm -hmm. and painting. Mm -hmm. And then through you know, the process of creating the digital works started in a place that very much felt like collage, where I was um, taking pre-existing, there were three-dimensional objects, for, but for me it was very similar to sourcing imagery mm -hmm. that I would use in my painting practice. And even my current painting practice right now sort of stems from collage in that I'm sourcing images in a very like archival way, right? And then assembling them in space to create these larger works. Whereas I think before I've been trained as a classical like, uh, painter in terms of setting up compositions, based on classical paintings and based on you know, observation. As I've experimented more and more on painting, it's become more about collage and the assembly of objects. Mm -hmm. So for me, creating the digital works, you know, I'd already started experimenting with painting these still lives, these assembled things, because I got really interested in uh, installation works, right? Mm -hmm. Really interested in how uh, in curation projects where people created scenes in three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And of course I'm seeing these not as someone who's going to the actual exhibits and seeing them in person, but someone who's consuming those through the flattened images of those. Mm -hmm. So drawn to the aesthetic of installations, I 
sought to create those installations in my own paintings, and then this became the next step where it was, what if I just created them within a three-dimensional space? Mm -hmm. um, but I had been making digital works for paintings of Andy, you know. Um, Which happened, started happening this year, or happened before, earlier in your education at Stanford, or? It, it just started happening during quarantine, where I was seeing how more and more three-dimensional spaces were becoming important mm -hmm. because people didn't have access to real-life exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So it started from an interest in showing my own work. I'd always made sort of like these fake images where I would put my work in a space, mm -hmm. in a gallery space, that, you know, mm -hmm. um, like put my work on the walls of the road or something like that, right? Um, and so then I started doing that, but in three-dimensional space. Like put my wall, my work on the walls of the Gagosian Gallery that people could actually walk through and see it. And that's where my interest in Blender came from. And I took classes that you know, talked about how to use Blender and those kind of things. But then, um, creating Bambi works recently, that's where I first started making works within Blender and then seeing them as these also have their own values and their own merits. And yeah, it's a new way to sketch. It's a new way to form ideas and to combine things that naturally would be in a similar environment, like putting Bambi and Dan Trejo in the same space. Yeah. Um, and I also think there's something about the process of me learning mm -hmm. this new medium, right? There's something about approaching a medium and encountering all of those, um, you know, when you first start sketching, when you first start painting, right? You run into the common, you know, you get like dry brush marks, right? Or you know, running into those little flaws and those little you know, cricks and cracks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I ran into those with the digital, you know, and that was interesting. That I was going through that learning process as I was sort of also going through the learning process in terms of looking into your work and you know processing those ideas mm -hmm. and those you know, feelings that we went through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's more. I think maybe my work, my work is like more about paintings and yours is more, which well, would be like emotions and thoughts about emotions and maybe your work is more about ethos, which is about the culture and about language and things that are happening in present day and it's more informed by present day. So it's very, I think that pivots, that puts you in, in, a, in a spot uh, in relation to the contemporary world. Um, where you're talking with your peers, you're speaking with a voice that's similar to the rest of your peers, and sort of evolving with the, the, the zeitgeist, evolving with the art of the world. So, I think one, a thing that's relevant to that, and that connects to that, um, is that even though you're, you're migrating into this new technology um, that's widely available, you're still trying to preserve the stuff that was important to you, maybe very early on, mm -hmm. and you know I think it, it was very important for you, Bambi. But, um, how do you define kitsch as it relates to your work in, in that respect? I think my relationship to kitsch is very interesting because I sort of encountered kitsch through the lens of pop culture and using pop culture as my sort of like language in which I'm able to tell familiar stories, right? Um, my mentor at Stanford, Enrique Chigoya, um, painter from Mexico, and printmaker as well, um, he used pop culture as an entry point into larger, more complex conversations, right? So the viewer is initially drawn, and then there's a second, you know, second reveal where they are sort of hit with something more complex. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's what it started with, is this moment of having something that people can approach and people can relate to and sort of gain this base understanding just from noticing that. The way it sort of shifted more into the realm of kitsch was when I started getting this fascination for uh, bad art, you know, and bad aesthetics, um, which had a lot to do with, you know, an 
interest in pulp, mm -hmm. you know, interest in, uh, in cult movies, but also cult art, and, um, you know, teetering on that edge of the uncanny and figuring out, okay, this image is comfortable and this image sort of slides behind people, right? Mm -hmm. And this image sticks out and makes people like, have a second you know, thought about it. And that was how I first encountered Kitsch. And gradually, as I've, you know, in my current painting practice, and also in these digital works more and more, I sort of leaned into not just those, not just the use of pop culture, mm -hmm. which is actually something that I've, you know, scaled back a bit, but more of finding those elements that are sort of noticeable and recognizable, but also straddle that line of game. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I and towards the end of my studies at the university, towards the end of my undergraduate studies, was researching the Uncanny Valley, was researching similar topics, um, and was, and, and I think maybe this relates to the conversation that we were having earlier about fear, right? Do you, do you see yourself reacting to the, that like, hidden like, elbow or like, hit, like hitting the kind of reaction that like humor bone kind of thing where you know you're looking at something that's like sort of familiar that isn't quite familiar and I mean what is that for you is it like spooky is it funny um, does it belong to pop culture in the same way that you were talking about just a second ago I think I think it's a double edged sword where part of it is it's funny it, the work doesn't take itself too seriously it's mm -hmm. in this common vernacular that people understand people can approach, and then there's the other edge of it, which is, it's, it does straddle the line of the uncanny, and that moment for me is very important, you know, mm -hmm. the moment where things become strange or uncomfortable, because for me, understanding that moment helps me understand, you know, that whole line, you know, understanding one point on that line helps you understand the whole path and the whole trajectory in terms of, you know, your value system, you know, the culture in which you were brought up, and also, you know, it helps you understand yourself as a person too. So for me, finding these weird moments is very important because once you find that moment, you can find out a lot about what that means. Yeah, for yourself. For yourself. Mm -hmm. So things like so you can talk very easily about these ideas. I think they're things that are very like uh, they're not new for you. This is like something you're not becoming an expert in, but like it, it's something you take very seriously. So, um, what do you think is an idea that you struggle with um, as it relates to all of these, to this new body of work, and then to all of these things that you already mentioned? Um, I mean, I think I think this might be a good opportunity to talk about you know the series itself and the struggles that that presented. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with just this was a unique opportunity in which I was producing work. I think so much of my relationship with kitsch and pop culture has to do with my experience and understanding sort of, you know, not only using imagery that comes from my upbringing and things that I'm familiar with, right? Um, but this became about, I'm using these, but in response with someone else's, um, with someone else's work, with someone else's thoughts and their feelings. Um, so the work itself became less automatic, biographical, and then it questioned for me, what was the purpose of these, does this language still work with that, you know? Um, and that was something that I struggled with, was seeing if I could speak the same way mm -hmm. through art mm -hmm. about a different topic. Mm -hmm. And what was your, what do you think was the outcome of the solution? I think, I think for me, one of the revelations was you know, in this conversation about empathetic voyeurism and, you know, what does it mean to look in on someone else's work and produce work about that, is that I don't think you can ever truly create just a pure response piece, you know? Mm -hmm. I think whatever piece you create still has those autobiographical elements of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And although 
although they're responding to something else, they're still deeply a part of me, you know? And that was an interesting moment too, where I was producing these works, and not only was it about, these are just mirroring works, there are parts of me within these works, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, that's when my relationship with Blender and trying this new medium came in, because I was also looking into these moments, you know, and seeing these, um, basically examining things that I hadn't examined before. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big deal to be, I think it's a, a little bit of a political act to be a working artist at this time. Because, you, because there, have been, um, <laughs> there have been articles about how useless mm -hmm. uh, our sector is, and, and I think in a lot of ways our sector was hit maybe what was it? What belongs to the group of uh, of people in the economy that were hit some of the some of the artists hit people? Um, and you know, it's hard to be economically productive and useful right now, which I think will have ramifications not just for how we define ourselves as a group, but how we define ourselves as individuals and economic units. Um, so you know, maybe even making art right now feels like a revolutionary act. But after the summer, which was a which is one filled with political upheaval. Mm -hmm. It seemed for maybe a moment that civil war might have broken out in the country. Um, making work like this seems almost um, seems almost superfluous and you know kind of it's, I don't even know what the word. It, it seems like you know maybe this is the the opportunity for artists to to critique high culture's reaction to to the pandemic. I, I will say that I think the challenge for me as an artist making work during the pandemic mm -hmm. ended up becoming what to say. You know? mm -hmm. Like I, the first the first painting I made during the pandemic mm -hmm. was this large diptych about eight feet wide, five feet tall, mm -hmm. and it was entitled uh, 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 "Searching for Art Market Opportunities <laughs> yeah. in the Midst of a Global Pandemic." Yeah, you know? that was funny. and it was you know it was. It was something that was about me trying to find an internship in New York. And then, but you know, I look back on that and that was not the most meaningful piece that I made during the pandemic or during COVID. You know, it, I feel that that wasn't necessarily what needed to be said. Right. You know, what needed to be said, sure. I feel like, comes through in this particular series yeah. where it's much more uh, questioning the responses. That, that we have, you know, and like we are in a time when so much of what we see is fed through us through Instagram, through social media, and our only way of engaging with that is through um, reposting, commenting, um, and there isn't a lot of questioning, you know, like mm -hmm. what is our level of involvement with these things, you know, mm -hmm. and that's that's a lot where that idea of warriors and came in, you know, we are just like absorbing these tragedies and absorbing this chaos and not necessarily fully in it. You, know, you have people in like, you know, there's suburban houses who are saying, oh, what a tragedy is going on mm -hmm. without actual experience, right. you know, but at the same time, you're not trying to be distant and removed from it. You know? There is some cognitive dissonance is what it's called. Yeah. 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 And so that's why I feel like this body of work for me, feels very important because this feels like a very real thing that I've been struggling, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of responses mm -hmm. and how to respond, you know. Um, and it feels genuine, and I look back on it, and it feels genuine. Where mm -hmm. you know, I look back at the other painting, and I think, you know, like, oh, I was just upset I didn't get an internship. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, which I mean, which the more private it is, the more personal. Maybe the less, less okay. Maybe maybe the less, the more embarrassing it is, the less you want the public to see it. But There's just different questions. You know? There are different questions. I mean, at any point, you can present any of those works. Yeah. So, okay, so, I mean, so, you know, your work is usually about personal themes, and it's about stuff that's uh, close to home. It's about stuff that's close and important to you, and stuff that you cherish, maybe like, um, 
memories of innocence or of a time that's distant at the time and perspective that you used to have. And you know, earlier you were talking about nostalgia as a as a means to to connect. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you how do you see in, in terms of this conversation, the spectrum of conversations that's happening in the world, how what do you see as the opposite of that? Um, and, and what do you see as, as valuable in your contribution to that? Um, maybe some would say that daydreaming is a, is a waste of time or connecting to yourself through your work and um, finding connections. Maybe some people would be critical of that as uh, not being uh, critically productive. But um, what would you say in, in reaction? The opposite of an introspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like maybe the opposite of the type of paintings that I make mm -hmm. would be um, just a um, aesthetically displeasing like campaign poster or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something that has immediate impact. Something that has you know this distinct purpose and meaning. And it wants you to do this thing, right? It's too little. And it's very little, right? That's, I mean, I think that's, that's what comes up when you make it work that isn't literal, you know? You run the risk of someone not understanding it, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. And making work that's personal, you're also, well, I feel like, I feel like for Homer, right? The Odyssey could be. Like, he could have been that Odysseus figure in his life that he was sort of like trying to work through, right? Mm -hmm. It could have had those elements of autobiography, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that creating work that is personal and that is autobiographical can have that same sort of impact mm -hmm. where others are able to relate to the story and sort of see themselves within that story, right? But I think that telling a story through a different lens for me feels disingenuous, you know, and it feels uh, it feels forced in a lot of ways. You know? mm -hmm. So I think that might be what I see as the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Something very like, this is my intent. Mm -hmm. In person. In person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you value one more than the other. You value asserting your your perspective, your, your self-investigation. I, I value, over like anything else, mm -hmm. value being genuine, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And in my art, if anything is to stand, if I had to strip away at, and everything, right? Mm -hmm. The thing that I would want to say is the genuine voice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, not trying to be something else, not trying to be something it isn't. At the core, if you strip away all the pain from my work, you should have myself as a person. The essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the essence. The essence. Yeah. Paintings that I make that don't have that same quality, mm -hmm. I throw away. I throw away, yeah. I throw away, I paint over them, you know. Mm -hmm. Paintings that don't speak for me, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes the ghosts of those paintings haunt 